And you turn with me to the book of Exodus, and we come to chapter 16 in our study of Exodus together. Chapter 16. I'll read it in two parts in a few moments. Uh, let's pray together before we read. Heavenly Father, we quieten our hearts. Um, we submit ourselves to your words. We thank you for the privilege of having your revelation, the scriptures, your word in our hands. We thank you for the privilege of being able to read from it. Holy Spirit, give me the words to speak well of our Redeemer, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus, in whose name I pray. Amen. Uh, Jerry Bridges once wrote a book called Respectable Sins, uh, Confronting the Sins We Tolerate. And it's a very good book, as all of Jerry Bridges' books are, and it's an excellent title. And there are sins that we rightly do not tolerate in the church. They rightly do not tolerate. If you imagine in your church community, this one or wherever you come from, if someone shared with you this past week that they'd been stealing or they'd been violent or they'd committed adultery, there'd be shock and horror and rightly so. And I'm not saying that we should tolerate those sins in any way at all. But Jerry Bridges says that there are sins that we do tolerate because they are respectable. You know, which good, respectable people do all the time. Anger. Getting angry when driving. Envy. Pride. Impatience. Worry. Being mean to your wife. And we can add to that list grumbling. Grumbling. Because grumbling is without doubt a respectable sin. It's a respectable sin. As I said last week, grumbling is one of those sins that we hate in other people. We don't like to be around grumbling people. Does, 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 does anyone like here to be around a grumpy old person? You know, someone grumpy. No, you don't like to be around grumpy people. But we invariably find ways to justify it in ourselves. And let me just again make this distinction that I made last week as well. When I say grumbling, I don't mean lamentation, I don't mean groaning, um, I don't mean disappointment, or even some forms of criticism. Because there are people, all of us walk through difficult seasons of life, when we cry out to God. And the last thing you need is to leave here today feeling that you just have to pretend that everything is okay. And, you know, be very British, stiff upper lip, keep calm and carry on. That's not what is meant here. Because the Bible is full of people who, who are godly who say, Lord, I'm scared. Lord, I'm hurt. Lord, I'm sad. Lord, I'm upset. I wish things were different than the way they are. So a grumble is not a cry for help. It's a complaint from those who think that they know better than God. They think that they know better how to run the universe, how to run the church. I said last week that groaning is hands upwards, saying, Lord, why? Whereas grumbling is a fist raised, saying, God, why? So there's a difference between hands outstretched and a fist clenched. A godly groan is saying to the Lord, this hurts, and I'm ready to receive from God's hand whatever he would have. A grumble says, this is terrible, and I will rebel against God for it. We grumble all the time, though, if we're honest. You may have grumbled today. If you're honest, we may have grumbled today. We may have grumbled about the church, especially the minister. Maybe about the weather. Or not, I'm not grumbling about the weather today, but I might grumble about it if it rains. About sports. My football team had the worst season ever. I'm just glad they didn't get relegated. Um, tr about the traffic. About tractors on the A66 going 27 mile an hour and you can't overtake them. About things that break. About things that break. About people who are late. Have you ever grumbled about somebody who's late? About people who who show up to church wearing the wrong clothing. Can you believe they wore blue jeans? Um, you know, about jobs that are difficult. We grumble all the time. We <laughs> grumble all the time. But, but in the early days, the Israelites were marked by their besetting sin of grumbling. So I'm going to read 
um, the first part of Exodus 16 to look at grumbling and, and we'll come back to the rest of the chapter a bit later. So if you have your Bibles, Exodus 16 and verse 1. They set out from Elim and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, where we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven from bread from heaven for you. And the people should go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and the Aaron said to all the people of Israel at evening, you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling, that you grumble against him, what are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. We'll come back to the rest shortly. So why is grumbling such a serious sin? Let me give you three reasons why grumbling is a serious sin. Number one, when we grumble, we distort the past. We distort what has happened in the past. They had lingered by those palm trees in Elim for several weeks, but they couldn't stay there. So verse 1, they set out from Elim, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin. And Sin has nothing to do with our English word Sin. And it is a coincidence that what they did in the wilderness of Sin was a lot of sinning, but it just means from the region of Sinai. So it is called the wilderness of Sin. And they left exactly one month after they had left Egypt. Numbers 33, verse 3, they set out from Ramses in the first month on the 15th day of the first month. So this is the 15th day of the second month. Another wilderness for the Israelites, a month into freedom, and suddenly their life as a slave people looks pretty good. They say in those famous words, we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. At least they're longing for meat, not vegetables, but they had regular meat, they had regular <coughs> meals to eat. They, were, they had regular meals to eat. Now they may have looked with fondness on their life in Egypt, but during their life in Egypt, they were, they were crying out, they were singing a different tune. They were crying out for deliverance in Egypt. Exodus 2 verse 23, during these many days the king of Egypt died and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. They sang a different tune when they were slaves in Egypt. That's why I say grumbling today distorts the past. They and we have a distorted view of how life used to be. Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. If it wasn't such a serious sin, this, this would be comical. It would be comical. You can just see them crossing, the, crossing the, their arms, their bottom lip jutting out, like a little baby. God doesn't care for me. Would that we died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. Nobody loves me. No one's watching out for me. They're like children. Spoilt children. Philip Ryken said in his commentary on Exodus, Patrick Henry, his American famous words were, give me liberty or give me death. And the Israelites said the opposite, give us bondage or give us death. Their complaining went beyond griping about their menu. They were rebelling against God's plan for salvation. That's what they were doing. They weren't grumbling about the menu. They were grumbling about God's plan of salvation. And sometimes all we want to do is to go back and we don't remember what it was like. Sometimes we want to go back to things that may have been better, but I can assure you the good old days are not the good old days. 
And if you tend to, if you're a person who complains about everything now, I can bet your bottom dollar you complained back then. There's such a thing as a serial complainer. Wherever you are, whatever circumstances, you complain. <coughs> and even when you're asking, I remember the good old days, I remember they were very, very much better. And I can, you know, and I think like that sometimes when I think kids these days, you know what I mean, what they wear, and I'm only 60 something or whatever it is. But I mean, so if you complain now, it's, you're probably looking at the past through rose tinted glasses. So that's number one. Grumbling distorts the past, but secondly, it exaggerates the present. Grumbling. So grumbling distorts what it was like, but it, exaggerate, it exaggerates today. Look at the second half of verse 3. For you brought us out into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. That's classic exaggeration. It's the second time that they've accused Moses of trying to kill them. They are accusing their deliverer. Just let me point out. The person who delivered them, they're accusing of being a murderer. They've conveniently forgotten the plagues. They've conveniently forgotten that Moses risked everything to be their deliverer. Now he brought us out here because he wants to kill us. I mean, it is absolutely ludicrous, this complaint. And we find in chapter 17 that they had animals with them. They had animals with them. So they could have killed some of their livestock. They could, you know, they could have had steak. They could have gone to some of those animals and milked them. They could have made cheese. They could have made butter. They could have had a quattro formaggi pizza. And they could have even had cheese and wine parties. Who knows? But they, they could have had a feast. But we're talking about wants, not needs. And this is the Israelites' problem. We're starving. We're going to die. You're going to kill us. They exaggerate. Now there's hyperbole, and sometimes some of us, we're the opposite. We talk very precisely, very exactly. So it's not always wrong to <laughs> embellish. I sometimes embellish slightly for my kids. <laughs> you know, just slightly to try and get a point across. But it can be a serious sin when we use hyperbole, exaggeration, to slander others or to deceive ourselves. And because there are some people who you can never take at face value what they're saying because their problems are always terrible, mountainous, and their successes are always rapturous. So you never really know what's going on. And you find yourself, is that, is that really happened like that? Did she really say that? So when we grumble, yeah, we distort the past, but we exaggerate the present. Thirdly, grumbling dishonours God. Grumbling dishonours God. The whole congregation grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And we see in verse 2, not just some of the people, but all the congregation grumbled against Moses and Aaron. It was their besetting sin. It was the Israelites' besetting sin. They grumbled when Moses came to save them. They grumbled at the banks of the Red Sea. And now what? He's brought us out here to kill us. They grumbled at Mara when the water was bitter. They've been thirsty for how long? Three days. Three days. And now they grumble a month into the journey because they're hungry. They truly are a nation of whiners. Let us not be a church of whiners. Let us not be a community of whiners. I pray that I won't become a grumpy old man because that's something that's very unattractive altogether. When you find fault in everyone else and everybody else apart from you. That's a really unattractive picture, I promise you. But their grumble wasn't against Moses and Aaron. Their grumble was against God. And that's why grumbling is so serious. Moses said, verse 8, When the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat and in the morning bread to the poor, because the Lord has heard your grumbling that you grumble against him. What are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against God. So when you grumble, and you, when you grumble, and maybe the church leadership, and, or the pastor is in your, you know, is in your radar, 
You're not grumbling against the church leadership. You're not grumbling against the minister. You're grumbling against God. And it's a grumbling spirit. And Moses and Aaron do not personalise it. And we should not personalise it either. We do take fair-minded criticism to heart. But much of grumbling that comes my way is actually grumbling against God. Because something hasn't worked out the way that somebody wanted it to work out. So a complaining spirit, a grumbling spirit shows that things are not right between you and God. The problem with complainers is that they don't, they don't trust God. They don't trust that God can help. Or oh, God is good enough to care. And that's why grumbling is not a respectable sin. Grumbling is a serious sin and it's against God. So what is the answer? Verse 9. Go back to uh, Exodus 16. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. And in the evening quail came up and covered the camp. And in the morning dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. <coughs> Gather of it, each one of you, as much as he can eat. You shall each take an omer, according to the number of persons that each of you has in his tent. And the people of Israel did so. They gathered some more, some less. But when they measured it with an omer, whoever gathered much had nothing left over. Whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. And Moses said to them, let no one leave any of it over till the morning. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till the morning, and it bred worms and stank. And Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning they gathered it eat as much as he could eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers each. And when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, the holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil. And all that is left over lay aside to be kept until the morning. So they laid it aside until the morning, as Moses commanded them, and it did not stink, and there were no worms in it. And Moses said, Eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, and on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, there will be none. And on the seventh day some of the people went out to gather, but they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Remain each of you in his place. Let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Now the house of Israel called its name manna. It was like coriander seed, white. And the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. And Moses said, This is what the Lord has commanded, that an omer of it be kept throughout your generation, so they may see the bread with which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, Take a jar and put an omer of manna in it and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations. And as the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before the testimony to be kept. The people of the Israel ate the manna for forty years till they came to a habitable land. They ate the manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan, and Omer is the tenth part of the Nephah. So we see three problems with grumbling. It distorts the past, exaggerates the present, and dishonours God. And now we see three lessons to overcome the sin of grumbling. Number four, if we're to overcome this sin of grumbling, we must believe, we must trust God that he will provide. We must trust God that he will provide. That's what we see in this whole story. You probably know it from Sunday school. The quail and the manna. And by the time we get to verse 12, it seems the Israelites have taken a step in the wrong direction. 
They need to learn again who the Lord is. Exodus is about the Lord who makes himself known. And he's been doing that through the burning bush, through the plagues and through the redemption across the Red Sea. Well, now they need to know again, who is the Lord our God? And that is what it's like as God's people constantly. We need to be reminded daily of who is the Lord our God. He is sovereign. We need to be reminded not just of little facts and little tidbits, but who is the Lord <coughs> that we gather together to worship? And the Lord that we profess to worship is God who provides. He provides our needs. The Lord that we gather today to worship is the, the Lord who provides. He says, I'll give you quail for a day and manna for 40 years. If you look at verse 15, if you have the ESV, and, and you will see verse 15, when the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? And there's a little footnote. You haven't got it here, you can read it when you get home. And you go to the bottom of the page and it said, it is manna, or Hebrew, manhu. Manhu. Now we know it as manna. But in Hebrew, they could either say it is manna, or what is it? That's what it means, what is it? One commentator said very aptly that the phrase could be translated, what do you call it? And they looked at it and said, what do you call it? And they said, it is manna. Or man who? What do you call it? And an omer is like two litres, by the way. So if you can think of a two litre bottle of Diet Coke or sparkling water if you're more healthy and it is filled think of that filled with manna think of that filled with manna psalm 78 verse 25 says man ate of the bread of the angels he sent them food in abundance he caused the east wind to blow in the heavens and by his power he led out the south wind he rained meat on them like dust great verse that and winged birds like the sand of the seas it's a miraculous provision he rained meat on them like dust this is not just some kind of, this isn't plant life, by the way. Some liberal scholars have argued it's insect ex ex excrement, by the way. That's what some scholars have educated beyond their intelligence have said. Or it's lichen growing on rocks. People come up with anything not to believe the Bible. They go, you know. But I haven't <coughs> eaten any of those things. I've never eaten insect dung. I've never eaten lichen growing on rocks but I don't think they taste like wafers with honey. Do you? I don't think they do, to be honest. Now, this is a miracle. This is a miracle from God. This is a miracle from God. And the manna only appeared when Moses said it would appear. It wasn't interrupted by the weather. It wasn't interrupted by climate change. The stop all protesters didn't stop it. It was, in, it was from God. And it was enough to feed millions of people because there were millions of Israelites. And there was twice as much on the sixth day. And if you tried to do more, if you tried to be strategic, it, would, it, it stank. It went off. The other nations didn't have it. It stopped on Canaan. It was a miracle from God. <coughs> it was not any natural phenomenon. You cannot explain it away you trust the Lord and give thanks to the Lord for his provision. It was a miraculous provision from the Lord God. But think of what an expression of patience this is by the Lord. After all that he had done for them, it took a month. You would have thought 400 years in slavery, the deliverance would have surely brought more than a month of thanksgiving and worship and gratitude. Thank you, Lord, for delivering me out of Egypt. You would have thought that they'd have been nudging one another or encouraging one another. Hey, it could be worse. We could be back there being slaves. Not a bit of it. Didn't even last a month. And they're saying to each other, what a sweet deal we had in Egypt. When we were slaved and we were beaten up, but we had some food. It was so good. They forgot. <coughs> and now they don't trust the Lord who did all of that for them. He has the power and he has the compassion to provide for them. Do you trust the Lord to provide for you? He has saved you. He has delivered you. He will provide for you. He doesn't always give us what we want. 
but he always gives us what we need. Do you trust the Lord enough to provide for you? It takes a lot of trust. This took a lot of trust, especially for an agricultural people. If we need food, we go to a supermarket. But they had to depend on seasons and harvest. They couldn't just go to Sainsbury's or Aldi or whatever and go and stock up and raid the stores of milk and bread and toilet paper when everyone else seems to be buying it. No, we, they couldn't do any of that. They had to trust the Lord for their daily bread. They truly had to. They didn't know where their meal was coming from, so they had to trust the Lord. They had to trust that God was right. I think sometimes our affluent society, and we live in a very affluent society, has deadened our senses. So it's, that it's the Lord who provides. It is the Lord God who provides. And the Lord taught them this lesson in the wilderness. I'm not going to give you a year's supply of toilet paper. I'm not going to give you a year's supply of manna. That's what we want. Now I'll give you enough for today. What about tomorrow? I'll give it to you tomorrow. And what about the day after that? Well, when we, get, when we get there, my mercies are new every morning. Jesus had this in mind when he taught us to pray. Give us this day our daily bread. We want a lifetime supply of bread. I'm not saying that these things are wrong, but we want to be insured up to the hill. We want to make sure that we can do everything in our own strength for as long as it takes. But the Lord is saying, no, you need to trust in me for today. Jesus says, I'll give you what you need today. And tomorrow, I'll give you what you need tomorrow. Matthew 6, verse 25. Do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink. Do you believe that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases? The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. We have a hard job believing that. We love the verse, we love the hymn, but we don't believe it. In the human heart, we demand a blueprint, a, a blueprint for grace. God, I trust you, but first of all, can you show me your plan for the rest of my life? And if not the rest of my life, then 10, ten years, and if 10 years, at least give me the month. And God says, no, my mercies are new every morning. My mercies are new every morning. What is it when we're anxious? I've said this before, anxiety is living out tomorrow before we get there. But what, if this, you know, what if this happens? What if that letter comes? What if that email comes? What if they say this? What if that? It can drive us nuts. And one of the most profound lessons that we read from the book in Lamentations is that the mercies of the Lord, they are new every morning. And many of us want to run ahead of God's mercy. We want to say, well, what will happen and what will happen when? And I want to know what will happen and what will happen when. But the Lord said, my mercies, they are new every morning. Can we trust the Lord enough to provide? The next lesson is that we trust the Lord enough to rest. We trust the Lord. Note to self, this bit of the sermon is for self. But what does the Sabbath have to do with grumbling? Some of us think that the Sabbath produces more grumbling. All the things, we live in a country where everything's open all the time. But in Austria, for example, every, yeah, when we lived in Austria, the shops all shut on Sundays. Much better, much better rhythm of life, by the way. We forget a much better rhythm of life when the shops are not open on Sunday. But anyway, some of us think that the Sabbath is just more grumbling. All the things we can't do, it's a day for grumbling. We grumble because we don't trust, and one of the ways we show that we trust is by resting one day in seven. The same people who are scurrying around like anxious rabbits on the Sabbath are those who are holding manna on the other days of the week. Thinking God has given us a lot here, but I need to stock up. I need to be one step ahead of God. What happened to the manna? It stank, it putrefied. You couldn't eat it the next day. It wasn't meant to be saved because God had more grace for tomorrow. So when they get to the Sabbath, the one day of the week, on the sixth day you go out and get twice as much because you're not going to do it on the seventh day. I'm going to give you what you need on the seventh day on the sixth day because the seventh day is a holy day, a day of worship and a day of rest. When we get to the Ten Commandments, we'll talk more about the Sabbath because 
There are elements of continuity and discontinuity from the old to the new, I would say that. There are. But it'd be surprising if the Sabbath principle is eliminated in the New Testament because it's rooted in creation. I'll go more into that a bit later. But here we see it present. This is before Sinai. This is before Sinai. So you cannot say that Sabbath is just another Mosaic command. Because the Sabbath is before the law is given at Sinai. So what does this mean for us? Well, we do not need to or have to get into a minute list of all the commandments you can and can't do on the Lord's Day. I think that was a legalistic problem of previous generations. <laughs> that being said, the number of people here today, me included, who are in danger of legalism on the Lord's Day are quite small. Because that's not the danger <laughs> that, most, that most Western Christians fall into. Undue legalism is not my biggest danger. No, it's n neglect the gift that God gives us. And it's a gift that God gives us. Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. What did Jesus say? God said, I've given you a day of rest. What does that mean? We get to worship him. We get to rest. The rest of the week is you have to. But today we get to. So the Sabbath is a gift. The Lord's Day is a gift. It is meant for you, for your good. If you would only learn what it is to rest. Some of us are wired to work all the time. And I know what it's like if you're alone, I work because it fills the time. What is harder to do, work or rest? Rest. It's not the same as laziness, it's not the same as inactivity, but purposeful rest. And God, it's a God-given principle, but it's harder to rest than it is to work. God gives us this gift of the Sabbath if we will trust him enough to rest. I believe when it comes to sleep and rest, I have a teenage son who doesn't like sleeping very much, you can <coughs> borrow time. You can borrow time, but you can never steal time. So you can get three hours of sleep one night, you can go on a sleep deficit, you'll last for a while, you can borrow, but you cannot steal it because you'll get sick and you'll crash. So you, we are not invincible. None of us are invincible. God gave us the Sabbath for our good. One day in seven when you experience the gift of worship and of rest. Can others looking at you see that the Sabbath is a day with unique priorities and special blessings for you and your family? Is it a family day? Is it a worship day? Or does it look like no different than any of us? No, no, no different to any other day of the week. This is a day when you do not have to keep up. It's a day when you do not have to stress out. And I'll say it as a repeat offender, it's a day you don't have to check your emails. So the Sabbath is the symbol for resting from our labours and resting in Christ for the internal rest yet to come. And finally, we need to trust God now and forever. We need to trust God now and forever. That's what the last paragraph is all about. We're fast forward in the clock to see some things that were made to happen because they're at the beginning of the journey. They haven't got to Sinai. And Moses is reflecting they'll have manna for 40 years. Moses is writing on the back end of things that are yet to happen now. And Moses says to Aaron, you need to put some of the manna in a jar before the Lord. It goes in the jar in the ark and the ark has not been built. So we're taking things out of order as Moses reflects on it. It goes before the testimony, either meaning the ark itself, or next to the tablets of stone which were written, that may be the testimony, but Hebrews 9 verse 4, having the golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna. And Aaron's staff that budded, and the tablets of the covenant, the tablets of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. In other words, these 40 years 
of miraculous provision needs to be commemorated. It is their way of saying we will always remember that God provided for us. We'll put it in the ark to remember now and forever. The only problem is we do not have the ark. Indiana Jones is not a true story. They did not really find the ark. You know that, right? But we have found Jesus. As Wes prayed, we have found Jesus. John 6, 25. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you're, not, you're seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus said, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. So the Jews are demanding a sign. They're saying to Jesus, what works do you perform? Prove yourself. Now remember some of the big things that we are used to seeing. Remember, 40 years of manna in the wilderness. That's the kind of thing that we know that we're dealing with a real prophet. So Jesus, prove yourself to us. And Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father who gives the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes from heaven and gives life to the world. They said, Sir, give us this bread always. They're still not getting it. They're hearing Jesus' words, but they're not getting his meaning. We want this bread. We want this bread. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me, shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. So when we get to the other side of the Sabbath, when we get to the other side of Israel grumbling in the wilderness, when we get to the other side of the ark, lest you're tempted to think these are just nice, interesting, historical Old Testament lessons, Jesus says, do you trust that I have more than enough to provide for your needs? Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Isn't that what you want? That's what I want. Never to hunger, never to thirst. To know day after day, he is enough. I'm not going to be hungry. I will have enough to drink. Because Jesus is the provision. Because Jesus is the bread of heaven. They said, wouldn't it be nice if Jesus physically gave us that food, physically gave us the water, but he gives us something far better. He gives us himself. Jesus gives us himself. He gives us the truth of his words. He gives us the realisation if we have the faith to accept it, that if you belong to Jesus, his mercies are new every morning. Every morning you wake up and you're a child of God. There's nothing better. Every morning you wake up, my sins are forgiven. Every morning to know that you can put away that crazy rat race that we live in. You don't have to prove that you're a good enough mum. I don't have to prove I'm a good enough pastor, that I am good enough, that I can do this. Another day to prove to the world that I have enough followers, enough likes on Facebook, that I'm worth something, that I'm valuable to somebody. And Jesus said, you're going to be hungry. The world will never feed you. Your clicks will never feed you. Your likes will never feed you. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. All that proving, all that striving, Jesus can give us rest for our sin, sick, weary souls, day after day. And not for 40 years, 
but for the rest of our lives and for eternity. He is enough. He is the bread of heaven. May the Lord bless the word for his glory and our eternal good. Amen.